Hi, Simon Parker, um, living and born here at Instone Court, Munderfield Bromyard. Okay, so um, Simon, I'd have to explain that um, I can't, you probably did this with Julia, but I can't speak at all in between, so I'll be doing lots of nodding and smiling but not making any utterances, and that might make me a little bit weird, but don't be put off by that. Um, so I just wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about your yields and how many acres you farm and how many hop pockets you produce? Um, here at Instone this year um, we picked about uh, 80 acres of hops um, ranging from aroma through to um, alpha hops. Uh, we've been on six weeks and uh, yeah we, we, we've had a fairly good season. Did we see how many pockets? How many? No, no, no. That's a bit like asking a gamekeeper how many birds he puts down. You don't always tell the truth. We've done more than 600 pockets this year. So how many binds does that equate to an hour? How many binds an hour? Uh, well... <laughs> or acres, sometimes that's the way it's measured. Um, well, we we run on different planting systems, so we um, uh, are planting distances. So we go right through from um, uh, 1,500 binds, sorry, 3,000 binds per acre. You've got to double it up for binds, for plants. Um, so anything through down to 2,000 binds per acre. Um, um, theory is that there's more light, you get more hops on a bind, if you're supposed to be very intense and you get more binds but less hops on them, it's all about managing them. But generally we like to run the harvester at 1,000 binds an hour. So we pick nine, nine and a half thousand binds a day, that's what we're planning. So um, uh, is there... A syndrome that one hop farmers suffer from. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, lack of sleep. Uh, well, the irony is that it's our longest hours, yet you're dealing with a, a plant that makes you go to sleep that's very soporific. Um, I, do, uh, I do appreciate my uh, uh, third week of uh, hop picking syndrome, which is the first week you're keen, the second week uh, you, you, you are tired, the third week you really don't care. And after that, the body just adjusts and you carry on through the motions. Tell us about the aromas then. Um, the aromas now change so much um, through, through the season. Um, you start with the, the early season stuff that really doesn't have the greatest aroma, because, but that's the best for brewing. And then you obviously move on to um, the, 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 the pungent flavours because there's a variation of the flavours of uh, the different varieties we now grow, like Ernest and Bramlin Cross and Admiral and, and, uh, and the new one, Jester. Um, and then you go through to the end of the bittering hops, which is the Pilgrim and the Target, which, which always smell ripe because they're generally very ripe by the time you pick them because they're at the end of the season, um, but probably don't have that. Uh, astringent Roman like the rest of the, the, the earlier ones do. And I think you might have told Julia that you find some of them addictive, and I think you already mentioned soporific. Um, addictive? Well, it is. It is. It is related to the cannabis, so uh, that's where the addictive qualities come from. Hops. Um, I, I. I don't think that has that effect on me. Um, I only like taking them in the beer. <laughs> okay. So, what are your first memories of? living and working on a hot farm? Uh, wow. Um, earliest memories would be um, uh, school time and the old hot picking machine we had. This is present once the third one I remember in my lifetime. Um, and the old one were the old ladies um, working on a skeleton crew. Um, and I used to go down there and plague them as a little boy, a little blonde bombshell and pestering them and I used to get tied up in the sacks occasionally when I was really naughty. Um, but obviously, uh, I suppose my first job in hot picking was uh, driving the bind loader, as any 60-year-old kid wants to do, uh, drive tractors. And uh, yes, I used to drive the bind loader when, they, uh, when as soon as I was big enough to reach the pedals. And so um, I think it was your father who grew four varieties. What in you, those days, yeah. Th what about you? Uh, we're presently growing 12 different varieties. Um, um, we're giving us not only a range of flavours, a, a range of the picking season as well, lengthening the picking season. Well, actually, it'd be quite nice because we've just been speaking to Barry. If, if Simon could sort of, you know, you could refer to your dad and him out there and then just yeah, build a bit of a bridge between the generations, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, yes, father, father obviously used to only grow uh, about four varieties in years gone by. Um, and uh, the way that the market has re changed recently, we're, we're growing about 12 different varieties now to give us the, the, the range of... Uh, range of flavours and the, uh, and lengthening the season for picking as well. So we're surrounded by pockets, yes. but not many hop farmers do pack into pockets anymore. Can you just tell us about that? Because um, you use the word <laughs> hot pockets. So yes. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm just going to add, it's the, it's the same question, but it's fine if you want to point to, because we've got lots of footage of this sort uh, of happening, yeah. haven't we? So feel free to, mm. you know. Um, yeah, here in Stone, we're still one of the few that are uh, using hot pockets. Um, my plans are to uh, change over to the modern system of bales. Um, I, I think there's less packaging with a hot picking at uh, a hot pocket at the moment. Um, we're still fairly traditional. Um, this old hole here was originally um, you can still remnants of the old pocket when they used to be tread in by hand. Um, it was a much smaller hole in those days. Um, and then, of course, we've upgraded to the push-button press, <laughs> electronically geared. Um, I, I will have to catch up, but, you know, it's, it's, it's what I'm set with at the moment. And when there's a, plenty of money for reinvestment, we'll, we'll move up to, onto the bales. Sorry. Just while we're on that, just... Sorry, I, I don't normally do this to our market. It's a bit naughty, but, yeah. you know, we spend a lot of time filming this whole process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It'd be great if you could just give us, like, a two-sentence precy of what was going on there just so that for the lay person you know the sweeping mm. of the hops you know if you want my um whereas the modern bale system generally is automatic loading we're still very labor intensive here um and we uh, when the hops come off the kilns um they're put on tipped onto the cooling floor and then we use the scuppet to push the hops into the uh, uh hole in the floor where the pocket sits and then we just press the button, and the uh, press pushes them in and firms them in. A hot pocket takes, a, well, depending on variety, a hot pocket generally takes between uh, 8 and 12 presses till he's full. And then we can take him out and uh, sew him up on the horse. And what happens after that? Is it, does it go out on the truck immediately? Um, once they've uh, sewn up and we've megged them, um, they just go into storage until the, the, the merchant calls for them. So whether they're stored here or uh, in the barn or, or they go off straight away on the lorry as and when the merchant wants them. Right, That's somewhere safe. about there. So you could tell us about them. Uh, I, I'm kind of interested where they came from and what, how I have no them? idea where these hooks come from. <laughs> These 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 hooks uh, for moving the hot pockets are, are a family heirloom. This is sorry, sorry. this. What was that? That was my phone. Oh, oh was it? Oh right. Okay. Sorry. sorry. Can we do that Let's again? Do that sorry. Again. So um, uh, I have no idea where these hooks come from. Um, these are family heirlooms. These these have been used for as long as my lifetime, and I remember as a kid my father using them. Although this year we have yielded and put a new handle on this one, um, but that's the that's the original handle. And I can't even tell you what wood it is. It looks like holly to me. Um, but we just use that uh, for when we move the hot pockets from the press here to the horse to sew them up. And that's about the only time we use them. But um, yeah, these are very old, as far as I can remember. Where are they kept then? Are they just... Oh, we leave them hung right next to the station where we sew the pockets up. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's great. We got it. Um, woe betide any student who loses them. <laughs> I've had somebody sew them sew them in the top of a pocket. They moved the pocket for me and then left them inside the hops. Um, so they sewed the pocket up. And then, of course, it's like the next pocket. Where's, where are the hooks? We've had to go back to the last pocket, untie it, get them out, sew it back up again. So, yeah, very valuable, these hooks. Tell us about your workforce during the harvest. Um, well, over the years, the workforce has changed. I mean, I remember as a child, it was, it was mostly travellers who, who would... Um, turn up, bring their caravans camp on site. Uh, then we went through a, a stage of uh, trying to use undergraduates. We thought it would be an ideal time for students to uh, earn a bit of money just before we go back. And it tied in nicely. It took up most of September. We would finish the beginning of October by the time they started back to university. Um, and that seems to have dried up now. Um, and the difficulties of employing people who 
we're in an intense period and we need everybody on site every day it's an intense job it's got to be done and uh the um the, the the need for people to do other things at the same time just didn't suit us so uh now we use um foreign nationals um, um we recruit from abroad um i'm i'm seem to get on very well with a bunch of romanians and uh they come over they do their six weeks hot picking and go back home happy and that's uh, they probably earn enough in that period to keep them going for the rest of the year <laughs> So, um, yeah, no, they work very well. And, of course, once they're here on site, they find it, you know, I don't have a problem with them running off to do other things. They're here to work and we get on with it. Uh, well, traditionally, uh, uh, um, many moons ago, um, in the days of hand-picking, school, um, schools would generally start when the hot-picking are finished. They, the, the old headmaster would go around and ask uh, the hop farmers, when do you intend to finish? And that is basically when they would start. Because it not only did you uh, import a lot of labor, the locals, it was good for them as well, the harvesting. And um, like, you know, when Bishop's Room used to swell by over 5,000 people, um, just a small village like Froome, um, you know, that's how important hop picking and hop, hop crop was to the area. And so everyone chipped in to earn their extra money to pick the crop. But it's quite different now. Unfortunately, I have to take my kids to school during hot picking. I do. I do remember when I was small, I missed about three days to help with the hot picking instead of going back to school. But no, even today they have to go. <laughs> what challenges face you as a hot farmer, twenty first century? Uh, challenges, I think, are still the same. It's still the labour requirement. Um, it's an intense period. Um, and it's six weeks, it's a short period, so, you know, no one's going to give up a normal job to come and help. Um, so labour requirements are, are still going to be there. Um, and the uh, onerous task of um, red tape is always there, no matter what we do. Um, um, if, uh, if we can't have the chemicals to grow the crop, if we can't have the staff to grow the crop, or we simply um, have a problem, um, a food-based problem, a hack up, something like that. Um, I can't see it stopping the crop entirely, but I can see it's going to have a detrimental effect. Um, it, it may come to a point where, you know, the hassle may not be worth the reward. You talk about the uh, old, uh, old times and hops and, and the research station. Um, I mean, we had Y hops down in Kent that did a lot of government-based research, and we had Rosemond here in Herefordshire. Um, both have since closed down. Um, um, we're lucky that we took the germplasm in-house. Um, the BHA was set up, and we now own that germplasm and have the rights to it. Um, and on the back of that, all hop growers now contribute to our research um, our own research um, that gives us a, a, a line in the research we want done certainly in the breeding program um, and uh, I can safely say that it's in good hands uh, under the BHA and um, I think um, under the auspices of Dr Peter Darby um, um, we have a good breeding program we've had some very good varieties coming out recently um, of course we have the aphid resistant um, hop which is world renowned and unique and um, we should be very proud of that our wilt resistance program and our powdery mildew resistance program is second to none and uh, and we're even doing research work on um, the plant breeding on um, more up-to-date things like uh, um, winter chill periods milder winters uh, some varieties like a colder time and then and, and sort of struggling in the spring and we're now crossing with South African varieties where there's obviously very mild winters, they don't have frosts. Um, so our breeding programme can um, uh, get around that and help us in the future if, if needs be. Um, of course, of the player matches and the hop competitions, the national is, 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 is the one to win. Um, that's the big one, which really does get the catch the eye of the brewers. Um, it's, it's, it's run by the IBD. And uh, yeah, that, that's the one we all need to win. Plus, the cups are bigger, so that helps. <laughs>
kind of like the ritual, you know, ev you know, all the samples are wrapped up in that purple paper and string and very neatly packaged and then they're open. Could you describe that whole process? And um, so yes, taking hops for, for, for a show um, is a, a um, we're using the traditional cut sample. So we're taking them out of the side of the pocket or the bale. Um, they're cut to their cube, wrapped in the blue paper. Blue paper is very expensive, very important because you mustn't let daylight get into the sample. It'll it'll um, change the colour of the hops if you. So it's special thick paper, so that daylight can't get in. Pin down, um, and then uh, on, on on show day they'll be open out just before the judging. Um, whether there's a sense of family, I don't know. I think um, there are so few hop growers now um, that basically everyone knows each other's business. So um, I wouldn't say that we're we're all best buddies, but we all know what each other's doing, and um, and and, and uh, there's a certain amount of solidarity. Um, when the times are good, we get on very well. I I I, I dare say when the when the times go bad and the price drops, we might be all trying to undercut each other. <laughs> so, is there something about the soil in this county? Um, well, the, 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 traditionally, the hops were grown all over the country, and certainly in 1711, when the hop tax came in, that narrowed it down to the two areas, the West Mids and the South East. Um, the two pest growing areas maintained it. Um, and I think it's mostly the rain shadow from the Black Mountains and our heavier type soils um, that have, um, makes it much better for us to grow. Um, I think the Team Valley has a wonderful uh, uh, topsoil and nice and deep and that's why they've succeeded. The Froome Valley has the heavier clay um, and, and, and attributes us to surviving the drought a bit better. Um, but yes, it's the climate I think as much as anything that's made these two areas a uh, the strong uh, strongholds of uh, hop growing still. So tell us about this year's harvest. This year's harvest. Um, this year's uh, has been okay. Um, for the West Mids, I think it's been fair to middling. Some places good. Um, the South East has had a terrific crop this year. Um, I think our drought here in the West Mids just went on that little bit too long um, into early July. We could have done a bit more rain a bit earlier. Um, but no, I'm very pleased with this year's crop. It's kept us very busy for six weeks. <laughs> That's great. And uh, just the evaluation one, because I think Simon's answer was very good before, so no we, pressure, Simon. Um, Sorry. Sorry, Marsha. We have to, because it's a lottery Sorry. funded project, we have to evaluate the project and wonder if you could tell us why you think, or may not think, why a project like this, recording people's stories, their heritage is important. Um, I think it's very important to record this historical um, element of hop growing, um, primarily because uh, for hop growing that has declined so much um, and changed so much over the years, um, we are getting to a stage now where we are losing a generation where it was community led because of the hand picking. And it basically, the industrialization completely changed the face of hop growing because of the, the invention of the picking machine. Um, and that was led by, not, not because it was a shortage of pickers, it was led by technology transfer, basically. Um, but it did kill off that sense of um, solidarity that was led in September. But we're getting to a stage now where we are losing that generation who remember, who still remember handpicking. It's a bit like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we still had the people who remembered fighting in the First World War. But that generation, we've lost them now. There's, I don't think there's anybody left now, is there? Um, and we're losing that now. The generation who remember handpicking, the, the, the anecdotal stories of what went on, and we're just about to lose them. And that's why what you're doing is so important. There's a few of us still sticking in the old traditional ways, but I'm afraid so I'm going to have to change. And, uh, and and change needs to be recorded. And I mean, finally, I mean, I think you said this before, Simon. I mean, why, why hops? What you've got a bit of a. It seems like a lot of farmers. I mean, your father was saying about a passion 
Yeah. Why hops, really? Uh, <laughs> why am I passionate about hops? Well, I mean, why hops? Why grow hops? I mean, why grow hops? Uh, well, that that's easy. Hops hops have always been here, so I, it's what I've been brought up with. So um, I'm conditioned in that respect. Um, uh, I still find them a challenge every year when you're growing them. You're growing next year's crop as well, and that's uh, that that's the challenge about hops. And of course, the smell—you can't. You just—it is—it is addictive. You—you you just absolutely love it, um, and uh, I think yes. And I'm pleased to be in it because, what were I doing if I wasn't hot growing? I don't know. I'd be struggling to be farming, to be honest. <laughs>